co-host. I can re-log in as a co-host. Mm -hmm. Well, let me try. I cannot even sign in as a co-host. Do we have a technical support team? So should we try to switch perhaps and I try to go first while they try to fix this? Oh. Yeah, that's, that's fine. Professor, Professor uh, Hamdallah, you, you, is the problem is at your laptop. Everything is fine at our side. And everything's fine yeah, at my yes. side. Yes, at our side, where the, we have you are a co-host and you can share your screen right now. So there but is a problem you, at your side. But mm. I don't see any problem from my side. I think I have to accept the uh, offer that um, the next speaker can start yes. until this is fixed. Okay, thank yes, you. Yes, I think so. Okay. Uh, let's see if this works for me then. Mm. Yes. So, do you like to introduce me first, or should I already start to try sharing the screen? Uh, just one minute, please, Professor. Just one minute. He'll, he'll try, and if it doesn't work, then we'll introduce you next, okay? Ah. Oh. Okay, that's yes. fine. <laughs> we can see your screen, yeah. Finally. So you can start, dear professor. Dr. Hamdallah, you can start right now. We can see the Please screen. Please unmute, unmute your mic. Dr. Hamdallah, can you hear me? I can hear you, yes. Okay, uh, we see your screen. You can start the, the talk, please. But I cannot see it myself, you know. Can you see it now? I can see it now. Okay. Okay. We see it too. Okay, fine. So uh, I, I thank you uh, very much. In fact, uh, um, I just would like to share okay. my views with uh, you. And this will complement, in fact, the uh, views that was expressed earlier, but by many of the uh, previous speakers. I, start, I uh, selected this title that combating zoonosis by living in harmony with nature. Uh, 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 it is very important because most of the focus is on uh, uh, how to deal with the current uh, situation uh, rather than to look at the root causes of the current situation. In, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in fact, the outbreaks of animal born and other infectious diseases are on the rise and the 
pathogens in now the cross from animals to humans and they spread quickly and uh, and uh, 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 the covid-19 was not the first one because in the recent decades we have seen many dramatic destructive novel diseases and uh, some of these diseases were we were referred to in fact by uh, doctor uh, Awad Tagiddin, uh, who gave a number of examples. And to add to this, again, uh, the Ebola, the influenza, the bear, the flu, the uh, human pandemic influenza, and uh, the Zika virus, and the many others. And the coronavirus pandemic is causing unprecedented human suffering social devastation and economic damage. And as has been said by Dr. Rabat Maharabat this morning, that the total number of reported cases now exceeds 25 million, and the total number of deaths exceeds 850,000 deaths by the end of the last month. And in fact, the disease has economic costs, the zoonotic diseases have a very large economic costs. The costs to the zoonotic diseases has been estimated at more than 100 billion in the last two decades. And this is with the exclusion of the COVID pandemic, which expected to reach something like 9 trillion US dollar over the next few years. The disease or the COVID-19 revealed a number of issues, revealed that the health infrastructure globally is largely reactive and frequently hampered by the limited knowledge about the source of the disease. And also the pandemic showed the level of unemployment around the world as a result of the pandemic and affected the lives of billions of people around the world. And again, the measures to slow the spread of COVID-19 continue to be focusing on the economic activities around the world. And even though the potential of the economic activities did not address the indirect costs with regard to travel, trade, and other activities. In fact, we have to know that while emerging diseases might have acute costs in the short term, that also they have potential to become established in human populations, and this will lead to long economic costs. Uh, also, now the governments are in a real dilemma to face the hard choice between how to expect, how to spend on public safety, safety or on reviving the economy. And it is giving the countries a very difficult situation. The main reason for the spread of the zoonosis and the COVID crisis is mainly due to the unsustainability of our development paths. We talk about sustainable development, sustainable development 2030, but very uh, 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 little has been accomplished in this direction. And in fact, because of the unsustainable development path, the natural resources are increasingly uh, vulnerable to pandemics and other health threats. And it is very important that we have to think about how human behaviors increase our interactions with the disease-infected animals. We have to look at this uh, very carefully. And without this, it will be difficult to control or succeed in combating zoonosis. And Many countries now are putting in place recovery programs, but the recovery programs are focusing on the socioeconomic impacts of the pandemic. 
And in fact, we recovery from the pandemic will be decided or determined by the way, how will we establish or develop our national recovery plans? Will we continue with an unsustainable trajectory, an unsustainable path, or we will take into consideration that we have to live in harmony with nature? And we have to recognize the fundamental link between nature and the human health and to take action to rebalance our relationship with the natural world. The success, I have been hearing a lot about the development of vaccines and antiviral drugs to prevent or treat the coronavirus infection, infections and also other infectious diseases. This will not impact the success of post-20, uh, sorry, post-COVID-19 pandemic will not be determined by the development of vaccines and viral drugs only to prevent the disease, but also by a better understanding of the context and the nature of the risk and its drivers and delivering in harmony with nature. As we seek to build back better after COP15, recovery plans will in fact look are still looking at the short term impacts while we must realize that the over exploitation of nature and biodiversity is one of the key, the key factors behind the spread of new diseases and this must be taken into consideration the spread of the new coronavirus of covid 19 follows a number of disease that, that have very emerged in the past decades or in the recent decades. And there is increasing evidence that over exploitation of nature and its biodiversity is one of the factors behind the spread of the new diseases. We have to live in harmony with nature. Both nature and the human health are connected. And just a simple definition of nature, nature covers all existing systems created at the same time as the earth. And biodiversity is part of nature, which is the alive part of nature. And biodiversity includes all living organisms found in the atmosphere, on land, in water, and the basic building blocks of biodiversity, in fact, are at the three levels. We have the habitats and the ecosystem diversity, the diversity of the uh, forest ecosystems, uh, agricultural ecosystems, uh, desert ecosystems, marine ecosystems. And in each of these ecosystems, we have number of species, different species. And within the species was uh, the genetic diversity, diverse genetic uh, uh, resources in each of these species. And all these species have a role to play. And in fact, the reaction of these species with each other, as well as with the, its environment, they generate many goods and services. Uh, many goods such as food, such as medicine, and the many services that are not traded in the markets, such as the formation of oxygen, the disposal of waste, the purification and recycling of water, the pollination of plants, renewal of soil fertility, and the stabilization of our climate, and control of diseases and the pollution. And this is, it is important. And when we look at biodiversity and the health, biodiversity provides a lot for health and well-being of the people. The drugs derived from natural products may be the most direct and concrete example of the link between biodiversity and medicine. Uh, antibiotics are produced by microorganisms, which are biodiversity. Antivirals, antibacterial, antifungal, and all this. And also we rely on biodiversity for new medicines. And the other benefits from biodiversity could be psychological, could be physiological, 
uh, could be also mental and physical health benefits. And also the biodiversity is important for the regulation of the air system, the climate change and other uh, systems. And it helps the people to adapt to the climate change and moderating the impacts and disasters. However, the unprecedented improvement in human health has been at the cost of extensive degradation of the nature of the ecological and biological systems. They lead to disturbance and the changes in the diversity of species and habitats, and they lead to increase in human population that the, the, the and human population, in fact, added to this problem. We have three minutes left, dear professor. And of course, when we destroy biological diversity, when we destroy the ecosystems, we enhance the opportunities for contact at the animal, human, and the environment interface, facilitating the spread of the disease. And in fact, almost 50% of global zoonosis resulted from the land use change and the food production and the agricultural change because these activities destroyed the ecosystems and destroyed biological uh, diversity. And also the, our activities increased the contact between people and the wildlife and the wildlife that harbor pathogens. And also trade in wildlife involves the contact between wildlife and the people. And this, in fact, also increases the spread of the disease. We talk about that the COVID-19 probably emerged from uh, infected uh, bat or the virus was harbored by the bats. But why the bats went to the settlements? The bats and other wild life, they go to settlements when the, their ecosystems are destroyed. So they leave the ecosystems, their natural ecosystems, and go to human settlements. And there they transfer the disease to humans and other animals. And COVID-19, in fact, was driven by a number of activities. These activities, and you can see on the screen, all of these result in the destruction of nature and ecosystems. And we have to make every effort to conserve biological diversity and nature. Uh, otherwise, the spread of infectious diseases and zoonoses will continue and we will continue in this vicious cycle. Thank you. Thank you very much, dear professor, for commitment to the time and for uh, the valuable talk about the One Health approach that we should uh, consider other factors and the ecosystem around us, not only the microbes and the management, but the prevention itself. Thank you very much. Uh, let me introduce the second speaker, Professor Dr. Frank Kerchoff, Director of Molecular Virology Institute, Alm University Medical Center, Alm, Germany. The talk will be about the evade immune defense against SARS-CoV-2 and viral countermeasures. Welcome, dear professor. You can start the talk. Do you yeah. hear me? I hear you, so thanks a lot. I hope you can also okay. hear me okay. And that you see my screen already. I... Yeah, we can hear you. Okay, great. Yeah, so thanks a lot yes. for the opportunity to tell you some of our work about innate immune defenses and viral countermeasures on uh, COVID, uh, on uh, the new coronavirus. So some of you may already know that for an RNA virus, this virus is actually quite complex. Um, its genome has a total of 30 kilodalton, which is, uh, sorry, kilobases, um, 
which is one of the longest genomes of RNA viruses. And when you look at the lower part um, um, of this figure, you see that most of the proteins that the virus encodes actually are called non-structural proteins, NSPs. The reason for this is that actually only a few of the, all these viral proteins um, make the viral particle. So the spike protein, the M protein, uh, and the, the N protein, most of the other proteins are actually devoted to counteract or suppress the immune response against the virus. And this is also one reason why uh, this virus can spread with such enormous speed and overcome basically all our defenses. Now in this slide to the left, you basically see some examples that were previously obtained for the first coronavirus and for the hyalopathogenic MERS coronavirus. So several of the non-structural proteins either uh, inhibit immune sensors like Rig I and others, or um, they block basically the receptors that uh, allow the interference to induce the innate immune response and so on. Now, recently we came across another very interesting mechanism that this virus uh, uses. Um, so it's textbook knowledge that the ribosome basically is necessary to translate the messenger RNAs into protein. And of course, this translational process is also uh, really required for a normal immune response. Now, what we in a collaborative project found out is that actually one of these non-structural proteins of the new coronavirus um, basically occupies uh, exactly this position in the ribosome that is normally uh, binding to the RNA to translate the cellular RNA to protein. And I uh, cut the story really short because you can actually read this. It came out a couple of weeks ago in, in science, but it's really amazing that this virus has evolved a tool where it goes in with uh, like a, uh, basically a short peptide structure into this channel where usually the viral, uh, sorry, the cellular RNA binds and is translated. And this is really a very broad shutdown mechanism um, of the immune response. Now, a cell is not really a good environment for the virus. And I apologize for the complexity of this slide. Basically, it shows all the antiviral factors here highlighted that have been uh, described as antiviral factors against human immunodeficiency virus. But of course, many of you know that HIV is also only in humans for about 100 years. So these factors really evolved as broad antiviral defense factors. And uh, many of them may also be active against the new coronavirus. So one of the factors that we analyzed is called the zinc finger antiviral protein, ZEP. Normally, SEP uh, can degrade RNA and it recognizes specific denucleotides, CPGs on uh, RNAs, to induce uh, the degradation of viral RNAs. That's one of the reasons why all of us have actually much lower levels of CPG denucleotides in our genome than uh, one would expect based on random, uh, 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 random numbers. So viruses, of course, often mimic the CPG suppression of their hosts. And this then allows them basically to evade the restriction of by this factor. Now, as you know, coronaviruses have been transmitted actually to humans about seven times altogether. You may have heard this already. And um, what we looked at first was how much is CPG suppressed in the natural bed host and in human hosts. And we found that actually CPG, CPG suppression is stronger in the human host. Like 
normally you would just expect a frequency of one um, and it's substantially lower. Now, when we looked at the seven groups of different coronaviruses in humans and their um, closest relatives in animals, we found that the new coronavirus SARS-CoV-2 actually shows very, very strong CPG suppression. And when we looked at the total of 200 bad coronavirus sequences, it turned out that those that are the closest relatives of the new coronavirus show the strongest CPG suppression, which means they're essentially pre-adapted to evade this restriction in humans. Now, next, we basically investigated if this factor is, is expressed in human lung cells, and we found that this is the case. It's also induced by interference, and we confirmed basically that interference, if they are present, they really efficiently inhibit um, virus replication and uh, virus spread. So next, we basically took human lung cells and we attenuated sub-expression with uh, uh, silencing RNAs. And what we observed is that silencing of ZAP increased viral uh, production by about nine to seven fold in the presence of interferon gamma and about threefold to fourfold on average. So this factor clearly restricts the new coronavirus. Now, the last story that I'm going to present you is on iPhytans. iPhytans are membrane proteins. There are three major ones that are located at different positions in the cells. And they are really known as very broad antiviral effectors and broad inhibit, sorry, broad inhibitors um, of the virus. Now, what we found is when we use viral particles that carry the, the spike protein of this new coronavirus, and we infect cells that overexpress the different ifitem uh, molecules, we get very, very strong suppression of infection. Uh, of infection, and uh, most strongly with uh, iPython 1 and 2. And the same was observed when we actually used the real virus. Um, and this is a log scale now. So the viral RNA loads were reduced by up to 100 fold. Um, and uh, again, iPython 2 had the strongest effect. So it's, in this setting, it was clearly an antiviral factor. And it, and it also blocked the fusion between infected cells and uninfected bystander cells. Now, next, we wanted to look more in more relevant systems. So we looked again in uh, human lung cells and gut organoids. We confirmed that the alphitems are expressed and inducible by interference. And then we performed an infection experiment in uh, human lung cells with the real virus. And we got a big surprise because we observed the opposite from what was expected. When we attenuated, when we reduced alphitem expression, we got an up to 24 decrease in viral entry. You can see this here particular for alphitem 2. So we get uh, a drastic reduction. And when we looked later for the viral RNA levels in the cell, uh, the supernatant of these cells, we observed even stronger effects in the presence of interference up to 60 fold reduction when we attenuated alphitem 2 expression. So this really came as a surprise. Further experiments basically showed that alphitem 2 enhances the virus yield by about four orders of magnitude. And this is a, basically a title test where you see plugs when you uh, infectious viruses around. So in this case, it seems that the virus uh, really hijacked the usual antiviral factor to its advantage. Now, this summarizes the three findings and the three stories that I presented. So the non-structural protein of SARS-CoV-2 targets ribosomes to, to shut down cellular mRNA translation and thereby the antiviral immune response. So that's a very effective evasion mechanism. We also found that the virus is uh, um, significantly restricted by the subprotein 
Although it seems to be pre-adapted pre -adapted to the low CPG in environment in humans. So that's a, an example of restriction that we found. And finally, we found that actually this virus evolved the ability to utilize items as entry cofactors. And we are now really following up on if this may also represent a novel target to block the virus for, for therapy. So it's an example of hijacking of a cell factor by the virus. So with this, I'd just like to say to thank my uh, people in the lab and many collaborators and funding sources. And I thank you for your attention. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Professor. Thank you, Professor Frank, for the nice talk. Uh, let me introduce the third speaker, Dr. Uh, Omar Abdelaziz uh, Abu Lata, uh, Health uh, WHO Technical Officer Surveillance COVID-19 Egypt Coordinator, uh, during his talk about the situational analysis of COVID-19 in Egypt. Uh, welcome, uh, Dr. Omar. Uh, do you hear me? Uh, yes, yes. Can you hear me? Okay. Yeah, I see. I hear you. Uh, yeah, yes. And you can see your screen. No. This is good. So at the beginning, I would like to thank you for the kind invitation and to be part of this scientific forum. Uh, Dr. Naim al Gassir, the new WR representative in Egypt, is sending her regards to you. She wished to be with you today, but unfortunately, because previous commitment, she wasn't able to join you. But for sure, I will brief her with the outcomes of this meeting. And I think that there will be a future collaboration between WHO and other stakeholders uh, participating in this conference. So uh, to go directly into the presentation, I, uh, the main outline of the presentation, uh, there are three main points I will give a quick update about the epidemiological situation of COVID-19 in Egypt. And, uh, and then I will update you about WHO response uh, to support the government of Egypt in its fight and its efforts to control the COVID-19 and also the other UN system and agency. We have a platform called UNCPRP, which is United Nations Country Preparedness and Response Plan. And last but not least, I will touch upon uh, the access uh, to COVID-19 accelerator. So uh, for the time being, as of the, uh, the 30th of August, the total number of confirmed cases is about 98,727 uh, uh, 98, cases. Yesterday, we had uh, uh, 230 new cases. The recovery rate is now increasing. It is now reaching uh, 73%. As for the case fatality rate, it is a little bit high. The case fatality, uh, according to the number of reported cases from the Ministry of Health and Population, is 5.5%. So uh, if we go to the EPI curve on the right side, we can see that there is a, a decline in the number of cases. H however, over the past few days, we noticed that there are some increase uh, in cases, uh, we cannot say that this is another second wave yet. Uh, we still we are observing very vigilant, but uh, it's an observation that we should keep following in order to have a clear understanding the flow and uh, and the uh, and the outcome of this outbreak. If we go for more analysis and and see the the the, the doubling time for cases in Egypt, we can see that. Uh, uh, the doubling time is about 14, is nearly 14 days, 13.28 days, and the halving time is 17.8 days. Uh, and we can see on the right side, in the right graph, that although that we reached uh, a plateau, the, the, the number of cases over the past few days and weeks are st still increasing, and this might alert us that we should keep uh, tracking the cases, enhance the surveillance system, support the contact tracing and the isolation of the cases. If we go for more analysis for cases and link the, the outcome of the, of the infection rate 
with the Egypt mobility data. By the way, all these graphs are generated from WHO tools, and most of these uh, websites are open for, for public domain. Anyone can access uh, these data. Uh, so uh, if we can see here, this is uh, Egypt mobility data uh, by Apple Map and also by Google, Google Map. We can see that at the beginning of the curfew, which is started in the 19th of March, there was a marked decline in all activities, whether we are speaking about driving, walking. And the, this decline was witnessed, especially during uh, May, June, but starting from July, the mobility start to, to increase, most probably because the mitigation measure has been leased and most of the curfew measures and the control measures has been uh, softened and uh, people get fatigued from complying to the uh, restriction measures and mitigation measures. So with the increase of the mobility over the past few weeks, whether we compare it by the Google Maps or the, by Apple Maps, we can justify why we can are what, why we are now witnessing increase in number of cases over the past few uh, days. If we go for the analysis of cases by Epi Week, we can see that uh, if we compare between Epi Week 35 and Epi Week 34, there is increase. This increase is 40% increase in number of cases. And if we go to the uh, Epi Week in terms of number of uh, deaths. Also, there are increasing deaths between EP week 35 and 34. Although this uh, 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 increase in terms of number is not, is not high, but we should still uh, look very carefully, observe uh, and, and support the surveillance system, the laboratory system, the case management for cases. Getting back to the second point of the uh, the presentation which is related to the support provided by WHO and the UN system to the government of Egypt. We are providing support in in nine pillars. We call it pillars, but in, it is uh, at the end it is public health core capacity that should be implemented by any country in order to control the outbreak. These nine pillars are country uh, coordination and planning, with, which is related because uh, the COVID response, it is not the job or the function or the duty of the Ministry of Health and Population alone. It is, uh, it, it, there should be a national response. It, uh, we know that it is a public health event, but other sectors, other ministries should also participate in the response. Um, another pillar, which is risk communication and community engagement. We have surveillance, rapid response teams in order to control the outbreak and do the contact tracing and the investigation. Points of entry, because uh, at the points of entry, certain capacities should be available in terms of screening, primary screening, secondary screening, referral mechanism, isolation. Be yeah, because, you know, uh, although the, uh, the, the disease or the COVID started in China, but because now we are all living in, in one village and the, the movement and the, and the load of traffic between uh, countries uh, is one of the main factor uh, behind the spreading of the disease. That's why investment and supporting the points of entry with the needed public health core capacities in terms of screening measures, thermal scanners, uh, isolation facilities, all these are needed in order to limit the spread of diseases between uh, member states and countries. The first pillar is related to the national, national laboratories. And we are speaking about the national capacities needed in order uh, to detect the disease in a timely manner, whether they are PCR tests, rapid diagnostic tests. The sixth pillar is related to the infection prevention control, which is one of the main elements. We know that uh, in most of the countries, uh, a big portion of the infected uh, population are related to healthcare workers. Uh, in some countries, it reached up to 20%. In Egypt, it is between 8 and 9%. So uh, uh, this is one of the main challenges and main area for investment and to support the response for COVID-19 is the infection prevention control. I'm speaking about training 
availability of the PPEs, availability of environmental disinfectant, the availability of uh, uh, proper ICUs, proper isolation uh, facilities, training packages, etc., uh, etc. Et the seven pillar is related for, for case management, and there is a WHO case management protocol, uh, and we have uh, several research protocol. One of, uh, one of it is related to the case management. We call it uh, solidarity uh, case management approach. Egypt is one of the countries who participated in this uh, initiative in order to uh, ensure that uh, uh, um, new drugs uh, are available in a safe way and in an effective way. The eight pillar is related to operational uh, and sub support and logistic in order to have a, a supply chain management, electronic inventory system, and to have a, 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 like an emergency operating center, all the facilities and the capacities needed in order to facilitate the response in terms of logistics and administrative financing. Last but not least, pillar number nine, which is related to maintaining essential healthcare services. Because uh, during our response for COVID-19, we shouldn't forget that there are other diseases other than COVID. We have um, hemodialysis patients. We have uh, patients who need emergency healthcare services, open heart, normal delivery, essential and basic healthcare services, even vaccination. All these uh, services should be provided and not be neglected. Uh, and it has been announced even here in Egypt, Her Excellency, the Minister of Health and Population announced that at the, at the moment, some of the deaths are related to patients who are not uh, uh, COVID uh, uh, patients, but they are died because uh, NCDs, uh, uh, non-communicable disease, or even communicable diseases. So this is one of the main area that we should invest as a UN system to support the government in order to ensure that the basic healthcare services are provided in a proper way uh, uh, for all the population. So who, who are the partners uh, in, in this initiative? WHO is, is the leading agency under the umbrella of the United Nations in Egypt with UNFPA, UNICEF, WFP, UNAIDS, FAO, IOM, UN Habitat, uh, UNHCR also is part of this initiative, UN Women and UNDP. We have all these partners were able to support over the past uh, eight months uh, uh, financial support, direct financial support and in kind support about four million USD dollar. I'm not speaking about uh, the, the, the operational support and, and the staff uh, cost support because uh, if we calculate this amount, it will go beyond, uh, uh, we can double and triple this amount. But I'm speaking about the direct financial contribution and the in-kind support provided by the OLEON system to the, the government of Egypt, uh, it was uh, 4 million USD dollars. Uh, the last point in the presentation uh, it is related to, to, to one of the main uh, 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 um, uh, crucial points needed to be taken in our consideration over the past few months and, and period, which is the, the accelerator uh, and which is minded by mainly three pillars, uh, how to invest, how to um, accelerate the accessibility and having a vaccine, an effective vaccine, to have a therapeutic uh, effective drugs and to increase our diagnostic capacities. The PCR now, we have that the PCR, although which is the, the, the golden um, uh, diagnostic capacity uh, or mechanism to diagnose uh, the COVID-19, but still the sensitivity and specificity of this test is not 100%. So more investment is needed to ensure that we have diagnostic capacity with high sensitivity, high specificity. Now we are speaking about uh, PCR point of care test so there is a global initiative. This global initiative is led by WHO, Gavi, UNICEF, and other countries. The main item is to accelerate the research, accelerate the investment in these three pillars, which is vaccination, 
treatment, diagnostic, and also to ensure that countries, especially low middle income country, will have uh, the, the accessibility for vaccine once it is WHO pre-qualified vaccine. So we have a COVAX facility initiative. This COVAX facility initiative will enable all countries to have at least 20% uh, of its population covered with doses. So if we are speaking about Egypt, which is 100 million, uh, and Egypt participated in this uh, initiative, uh, this will ensure and grant that Egypt will receive its own quota, which is 20% of the population will receive vaccination once the vaccination is accepted and qualified by WHO. Egypt is non gavi country, so this means that Egypt is going to pay for uh, the vaccination, uh, like self-payment, in order to ensure that the vaccine uh, 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 reach to its population. Uh, uh, the 20% is we are targeting the risky group, which are healthcare workers, those who are above 60, those who have co comorbid condition and pregnant women. I think that my time is finished, so uh, thank you. Yeah, <laughs> you have one minute left. <laughs> <laughs> I will take my breath in this one minute. So thank you. And over thank you, Dr. Abba. Thank you. A very valuable talk and uh, and really practical. We need the more uh, most of the details, and we are eager to follow with these upcoming events, inshallah. Uh, thank you. Uh, let us go for uh, the last speaker, but not the least in importance. It's uh, Professor Zainab Nabil Ahmed Saeed, the Professor of Microbiology and Immunology and former Vice Dean for Education and Student Affairs, Faculty of Medicine Girls, Al Azhar University, and very valuable talk about COVID-19 infection prevention and control guidance. Uh, welcome, Thank you. Professor Zainab. Thank you, Professor Maha, for your kind invitation. Uh, I really appreciate the, uh, uh, the full day uh, uh, activity of this uh, okay. conference. It is uh, well organized, and thanks for all the uh, attendees and the uh, participants and the organizers of the, uh, this wonderful uh, conference. Uh, my talk is the last one, and I know that all of you are so tired, but I will let, let it uh, um, informative and in short. Uh, COVID-19 Infection Prevention and Control Guidance. Uh, first, uh, let me tell you that at the end of 2019, a cluster of pneumonia patients with an unidentified cause emerged in Wuhan, China, that was considered to be caused by novel coronavirus named uh, 2019 New Coronavirus. WHO announced the standard format of coronavirus disease 2019, COVID-19, according to its nomenclature, for this novel coronavirus pneumonia on February 11. On the same day, the International Committee of Taxon on Taxonomy of Viruses named this novel coronavirus as SARS-CoV-2. And here, the abbreviation COVID-19 is known to be the disease caused by this virus. Uh, after the outbreak of the COVID-19 in China, SARS-CoV-2 has reviewed, received worldwide attention as an important pathogen and this is like infection. COVID-19 is declared as a pandemic by the World Health Organization on March 11, 2020. What's coronaviruses? Coronaviruses are a large family of viruses that cause illness ranging from common cold to more severe diseases. These viruses can cause respiratory, enteric, hepatic, and immunologic diseases. The coronaviruses are genotypically and serologically divided into four subfamilies. Alpha, beta, gamma, and delta. Human coronavirus infection are caused by alpha and beta coronaviruses. Seven human coronavirus types are known. And the last one is the SARS-CoV-2, which is a beta virus that caused COVID-19. It was found that the uh, ecology of emerging coronaviruses, SARS-CoV, MERS-CoV, and SARS-CoV-2 are all bad in origin coronaviruses which cause human infection after circulation in an animal uh, host. As uh, you know, this, uh, uh, in this conference, coronaviruses are enveloped 120 to 160 nanometer particles with a single-stranded, unsegmented positive sense RNA, 
with widely spaced surface projections on the outer surface of the envelope suggestive of the solar corona, and thus its name, as you see the structure of the virus. Regarding the physical chemical properties of the virus, it's found to be sensitive and inactivated by ultraviolet rays, heating at 56 degrees for 30 minutes. Most of disinfectants and antiseptics, such as diethyl ether, 75 ethanol, chlorine, peracetic acid, chloroform, and betadine. Also, SARS-CoV-2 was more stable on plastic and stainless steel than on copper and cardboard. Viable virus was detected uh, up to 72 hours in plastic and stainless steel. So, regarding the transmission of the infection, transmission of infection, infectious diseases must rely on three conditions, the source of infection, the rules of transmission, and susceptible host. Regarding the COVID-19, source of infection is usually symptomatic patient, patient in incubation period or pre-symptomatic and asymptomatic infected persons. Regarding infectiousness, patients should be considered infectious if they are coughing or sneezing or even talking, are undergoing airflow generating procedures as suction and nebulizer treatment, are not receiving therapy, have just started therapy or have poor clinical response to therapy. It was found that SARS-CoV-2 is highly variable and the transmission capacity is greater than previous SARS virus with high viral load in the infected people, up to billion RNA copies per ml of the sputum and long-term stability on contaminated surfaces, as I told you in the last slide. Current data suggests that the close range aerosol transmission by droplet and inhalation and contact followed by self-delivery to the eyes, nose, or mouth are likely route of transmission. So the route of transmission are respiratory droplets, contact transmission, nosocomial, fecal oral transmission is highly possible, but no evidence that SARS-CoV-2 can be transmitted through aerosol or from mother to baby during pregnancy or childbirth. So who are the susceptible or the high risk population? Those are persons who are in close contact with patients, healthcare workers, family members of patients, and laboratory, laboratory personnel. Unique epidemiological and clinical features of COVID-19 is that it has spread to 46 countries internationally. Total fatality rate is estimated to be 3.46. Average incubation period is around 6.4 days, ranging from zero day up to 24 days. And the virus has the potential for transmission via small particle, the ability to cause severe infection, no specific treatment, no vaccine till now, although more than 20 vaccines are in development. The Prime Minister of Sweden stated that equal access to a COVID-19 vaccine is the key to beating the virus and paving the way for recovery from the pandemic. And WHO in August 2020 stated that 172 economies are now engaged in discussions to potentially participate in COVAX, a global initiative aimed at working with vaccine manufacturers to provide countries worldwide equitable access to safe and effective vaccine once they are licensed and approved. COVAX currently has the world's largest and most diverse COVID-19 vaccine portfolio including nine candidate vaccine, vaccines with a further nine under evaluation. Javi, the Vaccine Alliance and the World Health Organizations, Organization working in partnership with developed and developing country vaccine manufacturers. It is the only global initiative that is working with the government and manufacturers to ensure COVID-19 vaccines are available worldwide to both higher and higher income and low income countries. What about the symptoms of the infection with the, uh, hepat with the uh, coronavirus or COVID-19? The main symptoms are fever, cough, and breathing difficulties. And intervention regarding the uh, management of the virus include effective surveillance for blo blocking the source of infection. Isolation is still the most effective means of containing COVID-19. 
symptomatic treatment and antiviral therapies whenever possible for infected patients. Early supportive inter interventions are critical for treating mild patients. Infection prevention and control guidance for healthcare professionals about COVID-19 includes that we have to avoid contact with droplets, so it's important to stay at least one meter away from others, clean hands frequently, cover the mouth with tissue or bent elbow when sneezing or coughing, when physical uh, distancing is not possible, wearing fabric mask is an, mask is an important measure to protect others. So isolation is the uh, essential step for uh, uh, those who have the infection. Infected people can transmit the virus even when they don't have symptoms to break the chain of transmission. All people who are infected are identified by testing, isolated, and depending on the severity of their disease, receive medical care. Even people confirmed to have COVID-19 but do not have symptoms should be isolated to their to limit their contact with others. So when to discontinue the isolation so the transmission-based precautions have to be stopped. According to the CDC guidelines, uh, appeared in August 2020, there are two strategies, either test-based strategy criteria or uh, symptom-based strategy. Regarding the test-based strategy, patients who are symptomatic we will have to uh, discontinue the transmission-based precautions uh, if uh, there is no illusion of fever without the use of fever-reducing medications. And symptoms, respiratory symptoms in particular, have improved. And results are negative from at least two consecutive respiratory specimens collected at more than 24 hours apart to detect SARS-CoV-2 uh, RNA. While for patients who are not symptomatic, this uh, period uh, is not uh, is the, is the only ten days, uh, so results are negative from at least two consecutive respiratory specimens collected more than twenty four hours apart to detect SARS CoV two RNA. While this test based strategy is no longer recommended to determine when to discontinue home isolation, except in certain circumstances, uh, as example for those who are severely infected or immunocompromised patients. CDC recently modified symptoms-based criteria as follows. Changed from at least 72 hours to at least 24 hours. Have passed since the last fever without the use of fever-reducing medication. So instead of having 72 hours free of fever, uh, it becomes 24 hours only. Changed from improvement in respiratory symptoms to improvement in symptoms to address expanding list of symptoms associated with COVID-19. For patients with severe illness, duration of isolation can be extended up to 20 days. For persons who, who never develop symptoms, isolation and other precautions can be discontinued 10 days after the date of their first positive RT-PCR for SARS-CoV-2. Of course, for infection prevention and control, we have to uh, do risk assessment. What are the risk, uh, risks to you? What are the risks to people around you? How much protection do we really need? And the SPE model includes three criteria, the severity of the infection, the probability of getting infection, and the exposure to infection. To reduce SARS-CoV-2 exposure during the COVID-19 pandemic, CDC recommends that facilities consider, uh, consider non-operative approach when feasible, minimizing the use of procedures or techniques that might reduce infectious aerosols when feasible, minimize the number of people in the operating room, implement universal source control measures, which include having patients wear a cloth face covering and having healthcare personnel wear a face mask at all times while they are in healthcare facilities. If the risk assessment is very low, wash your hands frequently or use gloves and wear masks. But in high risk situation, personal protective equipment has to be considered, including Google and protective clothing, a gown or outer protective clothing, and N95 respirator, gloves, goggles, and hair cap. Of course, we know the hand hygiene principles. Uh, hand hygiene refers to any action of hand cleaning that reduces the number of microorganisms on hand. 
any pathogenic microorganism transmitted by contact or droplet can potentially be transmitted by touch. Effective hand hygiene is an essential element for, of all infection prevention and control policies. Gloves are not a substitute for hand hygiene. Practices should assess appropriate moment of, uh, for patients' hand hygiene and provide suitable facilities such as alcohol-based hand rub at the reception desk and in the waiting room. Five moments hand hygiene is important to protect, uh, as declared by the WHO, to protect patients from transmission of infectious agents from hands or health of healthcare workers, to protect patients from infectious agents, including their own entering their bodies during procedures, and protect the healthcare workers and the healthcare surroundings from acquiring patients' infectious agents. And the five moments of ha for hand hygiene state that hand hygiene should be undertaken before touching a patient, before a procedure, after a procedure or body fluid exposure risk, after touching patient, after touching patient surroundings. Using personal protective equipment for whom? It is important to use this personal protective equipment for patients with confirmed or possible SARS-CoV-2 infection and for personnel should adhere to the standards and transmission-based precautions when carrying caring for patients with SARS-CoV-2 infection. And this table shows the various types of personal protective equipment, and uh, the, including the goggles, face shield, uh, gown, to gloves. Uh, as we know that surgical mask is important to be uh, 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 to prevent the contagiousness of infection, and both the patient and the susceptible host should wear this mask. And the CDC put uh, uh, guidelines for wearing and removal of such masks. Surgical face masks provide barrier protection against droplet spray containing mucous membrane of the nose, mouth, but they are not designed to protect wearer from inhaling small particles, while N95 and the higher level respirators provide both barrier and respiratory protections because of their tight fit and filtration characteristics. A common question is always asked for, is it safe to wash gloves before use? Washing of latex gloves with plain soap or alcohol can cause micropuncture, this condition known as wicking, and may allow the liquids to penetrate through the undetected holes in the gloves. For this reason, washing of gloves is not recommended. What about the precautions in lab? Written manual for safe practice should be available. First aid box, I wash facilities, a wearing of PPE, all spills and accidents should be reported, all con contaminated materials should be decontaminated before disposal or cleaning or reuse, appropriate containers and disinfectants must be provided. So what about the guidance for the pharmacists and pharmacy technicians? Pharmacists and pharmacy technicians should always wear a face mask while they are in the pharmacy. Everyone entering the pharmacy should wear a face covering Advise staff who are sick to stay home. Patients counseling or patients education should be conducted in a way that maintain the social distancing. Provide hand sanitizer containing at least 60% alcohol on the counter. Avoid touching objects that have been handled by patients. Using personal protective equipment, here I have a very interesting uh, uh, video, few minutes. Uh, it is developed by the Incision Academy. Uh, through the EKB, uh, I can let you see this video. It takes only a few minutes. And thank you. It's not working. I will try to get the, uh, the video. You see the video? No. It's not available? It's not. Unfortunately, it's not. OK, I will try to get it again, because it works with me. It's not displayed here, unfortunately. But it worked with me. I tried several times, and it works. Let me try again. OK. Why there is stop sharing? 
I don't know. It's not me. <laughs> Please let me co-host, please. Please let me co-host. It's very interesting video provided by Incision Academy. It's very interesting. So let me let me co-host again, please. You are a co-host. But uh, It's not available yet, dear professor. I, I try, try just let, let me try for one okay. minute. It will be okay if it's not available. But it's very interesting and uh, I want everyone to uh, have a look. It translate all I have uh, say, said. The problem with you because I tried several times uh, yesterday and today and it works good. I don't know what's the problem. Might be the connection. I don't know. No, no. It's, uh, it's I have the internet connection well. Okay. Unfortunately, it's not available. Okay, it's uh, <laughs> it's bad, but uh, already we passed the time. Uh, so we thank you very much for the valuable uh, talk and the presentation. Definitely prevention is better than uh, uh, treatment or management. Uh, now we came to the end of uh, the session. And uh, for the uh, attendees, kindly fill in the form of evaluation of the session. The link is displayed by Dr. Iman Hassan. And it's time for question and answer. If anybody has a question. Oh, I think Dr. Lala, most of the keynote speakers are not available now. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I just can't see. Uh, I, I didn't see, uh, 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 and here's Dr. Frank uh, is uh, available too. I didn't see uh, any even posted questions on the chat. So uh, I believe that everything is fine with the audience. If any of the key speakers want to discuss uh, any issue, do you have any questions? No? So we can end the session. Okay, thank you so much, Professor Maha, uh, Hamdiv, uh, and all the keynote speakers uh, and our valuable attendees for their patience. Uh, thank you once again. Uh, we wish to meet you on okay, the second day of the all. conference. Yes. <laughs> Hi, thank you. Okay, see you tomorrow, inshallah. Thank you. Thank you. Goodbye. Bye.